Chapter 23 They rode hard through the rest of the night and for most of the following day. By evening their horses were stumbling with exhaustion, and Garrying was as numb with weariness as with the biting cold. We'll have to find shelter of some kind, Runic said as they reined in to look for a place to spend the night. They had moved up out of the series of connecting valleys through the, which the South Caravan route wound, and had entered the ragged, barren wilderness of the mountains of central Ragfall Murgos. They had grown steadily colder as they had climbed into the vast jumble of rock and sand, and the endless wind mo moaned among the treeless crags. Dernick's face was creased with fatigue, and the gritty dust that drove before the wind had settled into the creases, etching them deeper. We can't spend the night in the open, he declared. Not with this and Go that way, Relic said, pointing toward a rock fall on the steep slope they were climbing. His eyes were squinted almost shut, though the sky was still overcast and the fading daylight was pale. There's shelter there, a cave. They had all begun to look at Relic in a somewhat different light since his rescue of Silk. His demonstration that he could, when necessary, take decisive action made him seem less an encumbrance and more like a companion. Belgareth had finally convinced him that he could pray on horseback just as well as he could on his knees, and his frequent devotions no longer interrupted their journey. His praying thus had become less an inconvenience and more a personal idiosyncrasy. Something like Mandarolin's archaic speech or Silk's sardonic witticism. You're sure there's a cave? Beric asked. Relic nodded. I can feel it. They turned and rode toward the rockfall. As they drew closer, Relic's eagerness became more obvious. He pushed his horse into the lead and nudged the tired beast into a trot, then a canter. At the edge of the rock slide, he swung down from his horse, stepped behind a large boulder, and disappeared. It looks as if he knew what he was talking about, Dernick observed. I'll be glad to get out of this wind. The opening to the cave was narrow, and it took some pushing and dragging to persuade the horses to squeeze through. But once they were inside, the cave widened out into a large, low-ceilinged chamber. Dernick looked around with approval. Good place. He unfastened his axe from the back of his saddle. We'll need firewood. I'll help you, Tyrion said. I'll go too, Silk offered quickly. The little man was looking around at the stone walls and ceiling nervously, and he seemed obviously relieved as soon as the three of them were back outside. What's wrong? Dernick asked him. After last night, clothes in places make me a little edgy, Silk replied. What was it like? Tyrion asked him curiously. Going through stone, I mean. Silk shuddered. It was hideous. We actually seeped into the rock. I could feel it sliding through me. It got you out, though, Dernick reminded him. I think I'd almost rather have stayed, Silk shuddered again. Do we have to talk about it? Firewood was difficult to find on that barren mountainside, and even more difficult to cut. The tough, springy thorn bushes resisted the blow of Dernick's axe tenaciously. After an hour, as darkness began to close in on them, they had gathered only three very scanty arm loads. Did you see anybody? Beric asked as they re-entered the cave. No, Silk replied. Argas is probably looking for you. I'm sure of it, Silk looked around. Where's Rel? He went back into the cave to rest his eyes, Belgrath told him. He found water. Ice, actually. We'll have to thaw it before we can water the horses. Dernick's fire was tiny and he fed it with twigs and small bits of wood, trying to conserve their meager fuel supply. It proved to be an uncomfortable night. In the morning, Aunt Paul looked critically at Relg. You don't seem to be coughing anymore, she told him. How do you feel? I'm fine, he replied, before careful not to look directly at her. The fact that she was a woman seemed to make him terribly uncomfortable, and he tried to avoid her as much as possible. What happened to the cold you had? I don't think it could go through the rock. It was gone when I brought him out of the hillside last night. She looked at him gravely. I'd never thought of that, she mused. No one's ever been able to cure a cold before. Cold isn't really that serious a thing, Polgara, Silk told her with a pained look. I'll guarantee you that the sliding through rock is never going to be a popular cure. It took them four days to cross the mountains to reach the vast basin Velirath referred to as the the wasteland of Murgos, and another half-day to make their way down the steep basalt face to the black sand of the floor. 
What hath caused this huge depression? Mandarolin asked, looking around the barren exposure of scrab rock, black sand, and dirty gray salt flats. There was an inland sea here once, Belgrath replied. When Torak cracked the world, the upheaval broke away the eastern edge, and all the water drained out. That must have been something to say, Beric said. We had other things on our minds just then. What's that? Garen asked in alarm, pointing at something sticking out of the sand just ahead of them. The thing had a huge head with a long, sharp-toothed snout, its eye sockets as big as buckets, seemed to stare balefully at them. I don't think it has a name, Belgrath answered calmly. They lived in the sea before the water escaped. They've all been dead now for hundreds of years. As they passed the dead sea monster, Garen could see that it was only a skeleton. Its ribs were as big as the rafters of a barn, and its vast bleached skull larger than a horse. The vacant eye sockets watched them as they rode past. Marindorallin, dressed once again in full armor, stared at the skull. A fearsome beast, he murmured. Look at the size of a teeth, Beric said in awe of voice. It could bite a man in two with one snap. That happened a few times, Belgrath told him until people learned to avoid this place. They had moved only a few leagues out into the wasteland when the wind picked up, scouring along the black dunes under the slate-gray sky. The sand began to shift and move, and then, as the wind grew even stronger, it began to whip off the tops of the dunes, stinging their faces. We'd better take shelter, Belgrash shouted over the shrieking wind. This sandstorm is going to get worse as we move out further from the mountains. Are there any caves around? Dernick asked Relg. Relg shook his head. None that we can use. They're all filled with sand. Over there! Beric pointed at a pile of scab rock rising from the edge of the salt flat. If we go to the leeward side, it will keep the wind off us. No, Belgrass shouted. We have to stay to the windward. The sand will pile up at the back. We could be buried alive. They reached the rock pile and dismounted. The wind tore at their clothing, and the sand billowed across the wasteland like a vast black cloud. This is poor shelter, Belgarath, Beric roared, his beard whipping about his shoulders. How long is this likely to last? A day, two days, sometimes as long as a week. Thernick had bent to pick up a piece of broken scab rock. He looked at it carefully, turning it over in his hands. It's fractured into square pieces, he said, holding it up. It'll stack well. We can build a wall to shelter us. That'll take quite a while, Beric objected. Did you have something else to do? By evening, they had the wall up to shoulder height, and by anchoring the tents to the top of it, and higher up on the side of the rock pile, they were able to get in and out of the worst of the wind. It was crowded, since they had to shelter the horses as well, but at least it was out of the storm. They huddled in their cramped shelter for two days, with the wind shrieking insanely around them, and the top tent canvas drumming overhead. Then, when the wind finally blew itself out and the black sand began to settle slowly, the silence seemed almost oppressive. As they emerged, Relic glanced up once then covered his face and sank to his knees, praying desperately. The clearing sky overhead was a bright, chilly blue. Garen moved over to stand beside the praying fanatic. It'll be all right, Rel, he told him. He reached out his hand without thinking. Don't touch me, Relg said and continued to pray. Silk stood, beating the dust and sand out of his clothing. Do these storms come up often, he asked. It's the season for them, Belgrath replied. Delightful, Silk said sourly. Then, a deep rumbling sound seemed to come from deep in the earth beneath them, and the ground heaved. Earthquake, Belgrath warned sharply. Get the horses out of there! Dernick and Beric dashed back inside the shelter and led the horses out from beneath the trembling wall and onto the salt flat. After several moments, the heaving subsided. Is Tuchik doing that? Silk demanded. Is he going to fight us with earthquakes and sandstorms? Belgrath shook his head. No, nobody's strong enough to do that. That's what's causing it. He pointed to the south, far across the wasteland. 
They could make out a line of dark peaks. A thick plume was rising from one of them, towering into the air, boiling up in great black billows as it rose. Volcanoes, the old man said. Probably the same one that erupted last summer and dropped, dropped all that ash on, on this tour. A fire mountain? Farrakh rumbled, staring at the great cloud that was growing up out of the mountaintop. I've never seen one before. That's fifty leagues away, Belgaras, Silk stated. Would it make the earth shake even here? The old man nodded. The earth's all one piece, Silk. The force that's causing that eruption is enormous. It's bound to cause a few ripples. I think we'd better get moving. Tar Ergas's patrol will be out looking for us again, now that the sandstorm's blown over. Which way do we go? Dernick asked, looking around, trying to get his bearings. That way. Belgrath pointed toward the smoking mountain. I was afraid you were going to say that, Beric grumbled. They rode at a gallop for the rest of the day, pausing only to rest the horses. The dreary wasteland seemed to go on forever. The black sand had shifted and piled into new dunes during the sandstorm. The thick crusted salt flats had been scoured by the wind until they were nearly white. They passed a number of the huge bleached skeletons of the sea monsters, which had once inhabited the inland ocean. The bony shapes appeared almost to be swimming up out of the black sand, and the cold, empty eye sockets seemed somehow hungry as they galloped past. They stopped for the night beside another shattered outcropping of scab rock. Although the wind had died, it was still bitterly cold and firewood was scanty. The next morning, as they set out again, Garion began to smell a strange, foul odor. What's that stink? he asked. The Tarn of Thok, Belgarath replied. It's all that's left of the sea that used to be here. It would have dried out centuries ago, but it's fed by underground springs. It smells like rotten eggs, Beric said. There's quite a bit of sulfur in the groundwater around here. I wouldn't drink from the lake. I wasn't planning to. Beric wrinkled his nose. The Tarn of Thok was a vast shallow pond filled with oily looking water that reeks like all the dead fish in the world. Its surface steamed in the icy air and the wisps of the steam gagged them with the dreadful stink. When they reached the southern tip of the lake, Belgarath signaled for a halt. This next stretch is dangerous, he told them soberly. Don't let your horses wander. Be sure you stay on solid rock. Ground that looks firm quite often won't be, and there are some things we'll need to watch out for. Keep your eyes on me and do what I do. When I stop, you stop. When I run, you run. He looked thoughtfully at Reld. The yellow had bound another cloth across his eyes, partially to keep out the light and partially to hide the expanse of the sky above him. I'll lead his horse, Grandfather, Garen offered. Belgraf nodded. It's the only way, I suppose. He's going to have to get over that eventually, Beric said. Maybe, but this isn't the time or place for it. Let's go. The old man moved forward at a careful the region ahead of them steamed and smoked as they approached it. They passed a large pool of gray mud that bubbled and fumed, and beyond it a sparkling spring of clear water, boiling merrily and cascading, a scalding brook down into the mud. At least it's warmer, Silk observed. Mandarolan's face was streaming perspiration beneath his heavy helmet. Much warmer, he agreed. Belgrath had been riding slowly, his head turned slightly, and he listened intently. Stop! he said sharply. They all reined in. Just ahead of them, another pool suddenly erupted as a dirty gray geyser of liquid mud spurted thirty feet into the air. It continued to spout for several minutes, then gradually subsided. Now, Belgarath barked, run! He kicked his horse's flanks, and they galloped past the still heaving surface of the pool. The hooves of their horses splashing in the hot mud that had splattered across the path. When they had passed, the old man slowed again, and once more rode with his ear cocked toward the ground. What's he listening for? Beric asked Polgara. The geysers make a certain noise just before they erupt, she answered. I didn't hear anything. You don't know what to listen for. Behind them, the mud geysers spouted again. 
Garion, Aunt Paul snapped as he turned to look back at the mud plume rising from the pool. Watch where you're going. He jerked his eyes back. The ground ahead of him looked quite ordinary. Back up, she told him. Dernick, get the reins of Relic's horse. Dernick took the reins, and Garion began to turn his mount. I said to back up, she repeated. Garion's horse put one hoof on the seemingly solid ground, and the hoof sank out of sight. The horse scrambled back and stood trembling as Garion held him in tightly. Then carefully, step by step, Garion backed to the solid rock of the path they followed. Quick sand. Silk said with a sharp intake of his breath. It's all around us, Aunt Paul agreed. Don't wander off the path, any of you. Silk stared with revulsion at the hoof print of Garion's horse disappearing on the surface of the quicksand. How deep is it? Deep enough, Aunt Paul replied. They moved on, carefully picking their way through the quagmires and quicksand, stopping often as more geysers, some of mud, some of frothy boiling water shot high into the air. By late afternoon, when they reached a low ridge of hard, solid rock beyond the steaming bog, they were all exhausted from the effort of the concentration it had taken to pass through the hideous region. Do we have to go through any more like that? Garion asked. No, Belgrath replied. It's just around the southern edges of the tarn. Can one not go around it, then? And Rollin inquired. It's much longer if you do and the bog helps to discourage pursuit. What's that? Rogue cried suddenly. What's what? Eric asked him. I heard something just ahead. A kind of click, like two pebbles knocking together. Garion felt a quick kind of wave against his face, almost like an unseen ripple in the air, and he knew that Aunt Paul was searching ahead of them with her mind. Murgo, she said. How many? Belgrath asked her. Six, and a Grawlum. They're waiting for us just beyond the ridge. Only six, Mandarolin said, sounding a little disappointed. Beric grinned tightly. Height entertainment! You're getting to be as bad as he is, so told the big Cherk. Thinkest thou that we might need some plan, my lord? Mandarolin asked Beric. Not really, Beric replied. Not for just six. Let's go string their trap. The two warriors moved into the lead, unobtrusively loosening their swords and their scabbards. Has the sun gone down yet? Relg asked Garion. It's just setting. Relg pulled the binding from around his eyes and tugged down the dark veil. He winced and squinted his large eyes almost shut. You're going to hurt them, Garion told him. You ought to leave them covered until it gets dark. I might need them, Relg said as they rode up the ridge toward the waiting Murgo ambush. The Murgos gave no warning. They rode out from behind a large pile of black rock and galloped directly at Mandarolin and Beric, their swords swinging. The two warriors, however, were waiting for them, and reacted without that instant of frozen surprise, which might have made the attack successful. Mandarolin swept his sword from its sheath, even as he drove his warhorse directly into the mount of one of the charging Murgos. He rose in the stirrups and swung a mighty blow downward, splitting the Murgo's head with his heavy blade. The horse, knocked off his feet by the impact, fell heavily backward on top of his dying rider. Beric, also charging at the attackers, chopped another Murgo out of the saddle with three massive blows, spattering bright red blood on the sand and rock around them. A third Murgo sidestepped Mandarolin's charge and struck at the knight's back, but his blade clanged harmlessly off the steel armor. The Murgo desperately raised his sword to strike again, but stiffened and slid from his saddle as Silk's skillfully thrown dagger sank into his neck, just below the ear. A dark-robed Grawlum in his polished steel mask had stepped out from behind the rocks. Garion could quite clearly feel the priest's exultation turning to dismay as Beric and Mandarolin systematically chopped his warriors to pieces. The Grawlum drew himself up, and Garion sensed that he was gathering his will to strike, but it was too late. Relg had already closed on him. The zealot's heavy shoulders surged as he grasped the front of the Grollum's robe with his knotted hands. Without apparent effort, he lifted and pushed the man back against the flattened face of a house-sized boulder. At first, it appeared that Relg only intended to hold the Grollum pinned against a rock until the others could assist him with the struggling captive. But there was a subtle difference. The set of his shoulders indicated that he had not finished the action he had begun with lifting the man from his feet. 
the Grawl hammered at Relg's head and shoulders with his fist, but Relg pushed at him inexorably. The rock against which the Grawl was pinned seemed to shimmer slightly around him. Relg, no! Silk's cry was strangled. The dark robed Grawlm began to sink into the stone face, his arms flailing wildly as Relg pushed him in with a dreadful slowness. As he went deeper into the rock, the surface closed smoothly over him. Relg continued to push, his arms sliding into the stone as he sank the Grawlm deeper and deeper. The priest's two protruding hands continued to twitch and writhe, even after the rest of his body had been totally submerged. Then Relg drew his arms out of the stone, leaving the Grawlm behind. The two hands sticking out of the rock opened once in mute supplication, then stiffened into dead claws. Behind him, Garen could hear the muffled sound of Silk's retching. Beric and Mandarallan had by now engaged two of the remaining Murgos, and the sound of clashing sword blades rang in the air. The last Murgo, his eyes wide with fright, wheeled his horse and bolted. Without a word, Thurnick jerked his axe free on his saddle and galloped after him. Instead of striking the man down, however, Thurnick cut across in front of his opponent's horse, turning him, driving him back. The panic-stricken Murgo flailed at his horse's flanks with the flat of his sword, turning away from the grim-faced smith and plunging at a dead run back over the ridge with Thurnick close behind him. The last two Murgos were down by then, and Beric and Mandarallan, both wide-eyed with exultation of battle, were looking around for more enemies. Where was that last one? Beric demanded. Thurnick's chasing him, Garion said. We can't let him get away. He'll bring others. Thurnick's going to take care of it, Telegraph told him. Beric fretted. Thurnick's a good man, but he's not really a warrior. Maybe I'd better go help him. From beyond the ridge, there was a sudden scream of horror, then another. The third cut off quite suddenly, and there was silence. After several minutes, Thurnick came riding back alone, his face somber. What happened? Beric asked. He didn't get away, did he? Thurnick shook his head. I chased him into the bog, and he ran into some quicksand. Why did you cut him down with your axe? I don't really like hitting people, Thurnick replied. Silk was staring at Thurnick, his face still ashen. So you just chased him into quicksand instead and then stood there and watched him go down? Thurnick, that's monstrous! Dad is dead, Thurnick told him with uncharacteristic bluntness. When it's over, it doesn't really matter how it happened, does it? He looked a bit thoughtful. I am sorry about the horse, though. 